Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sony Alpha 1 for movies and videography. I'm going to concentrate on video quality here, so if you want an overview of the Alpha 1, a deep dive into the physical side of the camera, or if your priority is photo rather than video, do check out my separate review of it for stills photography that I've linked to here. If you're a hybrid shooter though, be sure to watch both my videos. Since this particular video represents several months of testing, I've decided to turn off mid-roll ads to give you a better viewing experience. I'll make less money, but I'd love for you to watch to the end if possible. If you'd like to do something for me in return, I'd really appreciate a follow if you haven't already subscribed. Cheers! Okay, let's dive right into the movie modes, and as I chat, I'll go through the menus with the Alpha 1 set to the NTSC region, where frame rates include 24, 30, 60, and 120p. When you've got it set to PAL, these change to 25, 50, and 100p. In terms of file formats, the Alpha 1 essentially inherits the 1080 and 4K options of the Sony A7S Mark III, but it adds 8K on top. So you get to record 1080 or 4K up to 120p in 10-bit, 422, and in the choice of H.264 or H.265, along with all I options. Now 8K is only available in H.265 up to 30p and using 10-bit 420, but impressively almost every video mode can be recorded to SD cards using pretty sensible bit rates, including 8K 30 or 4K 120, unlike the Canon EOS R5 which demands expensive CF Express cards for its headline movie modes. I also love the chance to use H.264 for easier editing on older machines, or the chance to use 10-bit on non-log profiles, again unlike the R5, which reserves 10-bit only for C-Log and H.265. What all the Alpha 1 movie formats have in common though are a 16x9 aspect ratio, as there's no DCI options in camera, giving the R5 an advantage in that regard. The Alpha 1 will however output 4.3K RAW over HDMI using 4332 by 2446 pixels which can accommodate the DCI shape, at least in 4K. At the time I made this review there was no 8K RAW option, again giving the R5 an advantage there, but with the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus supporting 8K recording I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes an option in the future, so do check the Atomos website for updates. Another major advantage the Alpha 1 has over the EOS R5 is unlimited recording times, way beyond half an hour, and in my tests so far, more resilient against overheating too. Sony quotes half an hour or more of 8K, but here's my Alpha 1 happily recording a single 8K clip lasting over an hour and 20 minutes without any overheating warning. The limiting factors here were in fact my battery and memory card, and once swapped for fresh ones, the camera was happy to record another long clip. Now to be fair this was indoors in the evening and your mileage will vary when filming under warmer conditions, but the bottom line is the Alpha 1 handles long recordings, overheating and recovery far better than the EOS R5, making it a more practical camera and one you rarely have to worry about in use. Ok, before I do anything else, what exactly is the point of having a camera that can film 8K when you don't have an 8K TV and you're working on a 4K or even a 1080 project? I'll tell you what, being able to crop in without losing detail. So as an example, I filmed the moon here in 8K with the Sigma 100-400 DGDN at 400mm and is presented here normal sized in a 4K project, so we're not seeing the full potential of this video clip yet. Next here I've made a 4K crop, effectively doubling the magnification with no loss of quality when used in a 4K project. And now for a 1080 crop, doubling the size again, with no loss when you use it in a 1080 project. So beyond filming native 8K projects, filming in 8K gives you the opportunities to crop in on lower resolution projects without losing quality. It's actually a lot more usable and useful than you might think. Now for some real life resolution tests at Brighton Pier filmed with the Alpha 1 and the FE 16-35GM at 35mm f5.6, starting with 1080 at 25p. Next let's switch it for 4K at 25p, which is the format of this review video you're watching now. And finally for 8K at 25p, which is of course being downscaled for presentation here at 4K, but we're going to have a closer look in a moment, and if you'd like to see a bunch of Alpha 1 clips filmed and uploaded in 8K, I've got a separate compilation for you linked below. So to really see the difference in quality between these three full frame clips, I'll need to punch in for a closer look. 
So first, at 400%, with the 1080 clip at the top, 4K in the middle, and 8K at the bottom, where depending on your screen, you should see a difference in detail. To make it more obvious, here's all three clips again, but zoom to 800%, where the 1080 clip at the top is obviously suffering. Meanwhile, the 8K clip at the bottom shows the greater potential for punching in without losing detail, even when presented in a 4K project. Okay, now back to normal full frame 4K at 25p, before switching it to 4K at 100 or 120p, where the Alpha 1 incurs a small 1.1 times crop. To compare their quality, I adjusted the zoom on the 100p clip at the bottom to match the field of view of the 25p clip at the top, where you can see them delivering a similar amount of detail. And now back again to that normal full frame 4K 25p clip before switching to the APS-C Super 35 mode, which incurs a tighter 1.5 times crop, but oversamples the data from 5.8 Ks worth of information to potentially deliver more detail. So to directly compare their quality, here's the Super 35 4K clip at the top with the lens adjusted to match the field of view of the full frame 4K clip at the bottom. Now, I love real life outdoor comparisons and I'll always try my hardest to include a bunch of them for you in my reviews. But if you really want to measure and reveal differences in resolution, you do need to use a chart. So I filmed mine in all the modes using a Sigma 40 millimeter art lens. First up, here's a 600% enlargement of the full frame modes with 1080p at the top, 4K in the middle, and 8K at the bottom where the differences are pretty clear. Next, I'll switch out the 1080 clip at the top for 4K at 100p with the camera moved a little further away to compensate for the mild crop and to match the field of view. And next, I've switched the 4K 100p clip at the top for a Super 35 4K clip, again with the camera moved further away still to compensate for that APS-C 1.5 times reduction and again, match the same field of view. With all the clips viewed here at 600%, can you see the difference on your device? Sticking with the resolution chart, it's time to show some direct comparisons with the Canon EOS R5, starting with both cameras filming 1080 25p, and I'm again showing a 600% enlargement to reveal any differences. I've got the Alpha 1 at the top and the EOS R5 at the bottom, and both of them were fitted with exactly the same Sigma 40mm art lens. Next, here's both cameras filming normal full frame 4K at 25p, this time enlarged to 800% with the Alpha 1 at the top and the EOS R5 at the bottom, again, still using that same Sigma lens. And now here's both cameras filming in their best quality 4K 25p modes using oversampled data. Now the Alpha 1 at the top only offers this in its Super 35 mode with, you know, that fairly tight 1.5 times crop, while the EOS R5 at the bottom allows it in full frame using its 4K HQ mode, but for shorter recording times. So again, I've matched the field of view by adjusting the position of the camera, and again, both using that Sigma 40mm. And finally, for both cameras filming full frame 8K at 25p, again with that Sigma lens, but this time enlarged by 1600% in an attempt to see any difference between them. They look pretty similar to me here, but do you have any preferences in the other modes? Next, for a quick noise test using the standard profile at 3200 ISO on each camera. Here's a 400% enlargement of 1080 25p filmed on the Alpha 1 on the left and the EOS R5 on the right. Next, here's 4K full frame clips, again with the Sony on the left and the Canon on the right. And finally, 8K from both cameras with the Alpha 1 on the left and the EOS R5 on the right. Moving on to see what's possible with dynamic range, I filmed this scene with the Alpha 1 in its standard profile where the bright sky is saturated on the right near to where the sun is and the shadows under the pier are clipped. Now, while you can film any profile in 10-bit on the Alpha 1, greater retrieval is possible in S-Log. So here's a version filmed with Pitch Profile 9, which uses S-Log 3. And now here's a graded version where I've simply applied the S-Log 3 LUT in Final Cut and pulled back the highlights a little. Now, even without any real work, you can see how the 10-bit S-Log version has way more highlight detail and also the potential to raise some of those dark shadows too. For those who prefer an easier in-camera life, Sony's now equipped the Alpha 1 with s Cinetone, applied by default in Pitch Profile 11, and you're looking at it right now. For comparison, here's the standard profile on the left, s Cinetone in the middle, and S-Log 3 on the right with the LUT applied in Final Cut. Do you have a preference between them? 
Okay, now for movie autofocus, and to really test the Alpha 1, I fitted the FE 135mm f1.8 G Master here at f1.8, where it's got a tremendously shallow depth of field, and I filmed in 4K using a center AF area, and the camera is just effortlessly pulling focus between the two bottles without skipping a beat. Now, as I swing the camera from side to side, you'll also notice it's almost bereft of rolling shutter skewing artifacts, so that's good news. Hang on, you want another rolling shutter test? Okay, here's the Alpha 1 swinging back and forth in 1080 at 25p. And now in 4K at 25p. And finally in 8K at 25p. In extreme cases, you will still see some skewing if you really throw the camera around, but it's pretty well behaved compared to other models. Now back to autofocus again. Human eye detection is supported in all modes, including 8K and 4K 120. And here you can see it easily keeping me in sharp focus, even using the 135 at 1.8. In fact, the Alpha One's face autofocus is so reliable, I'd feel fairly confident presenting a piece to camera to it, even though the screen won't face forward for confirmation. That's one of the key benefits of the EOS R5, and in fact, Sony's own A7S Mark III. You can see it again here in a more vlog style environment using the FE 24mm 2.8 and again even though I can't see the screen I know the image will almost certainly be in focus. If you do need to see yourself though on the Alpha 1 you can always fit an external HDMI monitor and thankfully Sony's also equipped the camera with a full size HDMI port. Okay, now for stabilization, starting with the Alpha 1 and 135mm again handheld with IBIS turned off where the view is obviously ruined by camera shake. Next with IBIS enabled where it's absolutely transformed the steadiness of the footage. But stick around because if you wait a few seconds you will find that it actually improves the stability a little bit more. And now here's an example filmed with active stabilization. Now this incurs a small crop to provide additional digital stabilization that works in all modes apart from 8K and 4K 120. Now in this particular example, I wouldn't say it's necessarily better than IBIS alone, but it can be beneficial if you're moving the camera more. Now here's a real life example of active stabilization and continuous autofocus on the Alpha 1 fitted with the FE 35 1.4. This is B-roll for a retro video that I filmed about the 20 year old Sony U20 compact camera for my recent vintage Dynabytes channel. Check it out if you're into retro digital cameras. And finally out of interest, here's another clip filmed without stabilization which is obviously very wobbly again, but this time I've used a rather fast shutter speed of 500th of a second. And the reason I've done that is because I've now fed this clip into Sony's Catalyst software, and this can apply stabilization after the event thanks to gyro data that's recorded by the camera when you're recording a video clip. Now when you do apply that stabilization there is a crop but you can choose how much of a crop and how effective the result is going to be and often it can look really really good so long as you film the original footage with a fast shutter speed to avoid motion blur and that's why I chose 500th of a second. Before wrapping up this review let's have a look at some slow and quick motion starting with the S and Q mode which lets you set a recording and a playback frame rate allowing you to slow down footage by up to 10 times or speed it up by up to 120 times. Here's that fastest option, recording up to 4K quality at one frame per second, before then speeding it up in camera by up to 120 times. Great for easy time lapses. And now here's the slowest option, capturing up to 1080 quality at up to 240 frames per second, before recording it at say 24p for a 10 times slowdown. Now 240p is only available in the S and Q mode and only available at a maximum resolution of 1080p and there's no sound and it's also automatically slowed in camera. If you're filming in the normal movie modes though, you can capture 1080 or 4K at up to 120p with full audio and autofocus and you can choose the playback speed in your editor later. I captured this 4K clip at 100p and slowed it down by four times on my 25p timeline. And since the 4K slow motion looks so good and is so flexible on the Alpha 1, I've made this short compilation for you. See you on the other side.
my verdict. The Alpha One is that rarest of things, a jack of all trades and a master at most of them too. Not only is it an incredibly capable stills camera, whether you're shooting fast action or static subjects in very high resolution, it also arguably becomes Sony's best overall video camera. The A7S Mark III may be cleaner at the highest sensitivities, but for most ISO settings, the Alpha One will match it in 4K, with the added benefit of 8K, which captures enough detail to punch in on a 4K project. And while it is a considerable $3,000 more than an A7S Mark III, and it lacks its fully articulated screen, it is relatively affordable compared to one of Sony's cinema cameras, so the value proposition depends on which direction you're coming from. In terms of movie quality and autofocus capabilities, Canon's EOS R5 comes closest of all rivals, and personally speaking, there weren't sufficient differences in quality or autofocus to swing a decision for me. But given the R5 is $2,600 cheaper, with the added benefits of internal DCI, 8K RAW, and a fully articulated screen, it would seem a no-brainer at first glance compared to the Alpha 1. But in use, there's striking differences in practicality. For starters, every mode on the Canon R5 is limited to clips of half an hour, and if you film in 8K, 4K120, or in the best 4K HQ mode, you'll also need to be acutely aware of overheating and subsequent cooldown periods. In stark contrast, the Alpha 1 kept filming beyond 30 minutes until I ran out of memory or battery in any mode in my tests, even 8K, without ever overheating. Of course, your mileage will vary in hot conditions, but when I tested both cameras side by side in the UK, I was always conscious of babying the R5, whereas I never needed to worry about the Alpha 1. The Alpha 1's files are also more practical. If you want 4K 120, 8K or 10-bit on the R5, you'll need to deal with high bitrate H.265 that often requires fast expensive cards and is tough to edit too. In contrast, the Alpha One offers H.264 or H.265 for almost any mode, as well as 10-bit in all profiles, and almost any of its video, including 8K, can be recorded onto fairly normal SD memory cards. If you can live without 8K raw internal and a flip screen, the Alpha One is simply a far more practical camera, but there's also no getting away from the fact it costs $2,600 more than the EOS R5 at the time I made this video. Now, many of us would be perfectly happy to accommodate the R5's limitations for that kind of saving. It could even buy you a spare Canon R6 to use while the R5 cools down. Meanwhile, in Sony's own range, the Alpha One isn't far off the cost of two A7S Mark III's, and those remain extremely capable movie cameras if you don't need 8K. Ultimately, the Alpha One is not a cheap camera, and there's loads of great alternatives at lower prices. But none of them can deliver as complete a package with this degree of power and, crucially, practicality. Now, when it first came out, I was skeptical how Sony could justify its cost, but having used it for several months now, I found it increasingly compelling to a point where it's become one of my favourite and most trustworthy cameras. No other single camera can do everything the Alpha One does, and even those which match some of its features on paper often fall down in practical use. If you genuinely need this degree of flexibility and performance in one single camera, the Alpha One is untouchable. Right, that's the end of another in-depth video, so maximum respect if you made it to the end, and extra bonus points if you feel like subscribing so you don't miss out on my upcoming reviews and tutorials. If you found it really useful and are thinking to yourself, if only there was a way to reward Gordon beyond simply subscribing to his channel, then look no further than treating me to a coffee or yourself to my in-camera photography book, both linked below. Let me know what you think of the Alpha One, even if it's way out of reach, as it is for most of us, and if you'd like to know more about the camera for stills photography, or are just interested in technology, do check out my separate video that I've linked to here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.